um, have Antonio Gracias here, um, who is uh, among uh, many things, but for us a very important thing, a member of the Advisory Council of the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering and also the founder and CEO of Valor uh, Investment Firm. I'm going to ask Antonio to say a few words about his own professional activities and then we'll start a conversation. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So I think probably the most important thing for all of you is I went to the University of Chicago. I attended the school. Uh, I went to law school. Um, and I was probably the world's worst law student, so don't hold that against me. Um, I, the, the, I'm also now in the, um, recently joined the, the Board of Trustees, so I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and, and honored to be a continuing part of the university. Thank you. Um, interestingly, my professional background begins here. So it, uh, it begins actually um, at New York and Goldman Sachs, but I, while I was here at the University of Chicago Law School, I actually started the business I have today, the precursor to it, which was buying small industrial companies and fixing them and technaling them and growing them. And through a series of, I'd say, um, important accidents, and there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of students in the audience here? Are there a lot of students here? No raise hands, are all students? No? Well, there are some. There are some? Yeah. Okay. Well, interestingly, the reason I ended up investing in technology and becoming more of a technologist is because the first day of law school, I met a gentleman named David Sachs, who had gone to Stanford undergrad and was good friends with a, uh, a guy named Peter Thiel, which everyone knows these people now, and ended up finishing law school, going to McKinsey, and, and going to work at PayPal as the chief product officer. Um, in a time when you could be a law student, uh, poorly educated from Stanford, and actually just be a chief product officer. And because of that, I invested in PayPal, which led um, to a whole series of events. We, we went into the fund business and ended up investing in, in Tesla and SpaceX and Uber and a bunch of other stuff, right? But really, because of the University of Chicago, um, we were in our sitting. I had this, uh, this wonderful relationship with a, a gentleman who's still a very close friend of mine that started me thinking about the way technology has changed the world. And because of that, today we are, we're based here in Chicago. We have offices in uh, New York, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, kind of. It's sort of on pause. Um, we are going to open one, opening one now in Miami as well. And I think I, think I got them all. Uh, and what we are doing is we have a, a series of products. We have an early stage venture product that's really sustainability focused um, in food tech and retail tech in partnership with a few corporates, uh, namely Starbucks is kind of the anchor investor there. And we work on innovation in an, oper in an operational setting by um, helping our companies generate uh, revenue opportunities through our corporate relationships and then getting innovative ideas out of the corporations for our, that we can then go find companies that are, that are working in those areas. We then have our, our main fund, which is a growth fund, um, that works on scaling companies. So, um, you know, the, the, we have Evo Design as an example, which has come out of the PME. It's a, a company that I'm on the board of that is in, um, in, our, in our growth fund. And the growth fund is $1.7 billion. It, it typically writes checks kind of 25 to 100 for things that are scaling up. And we are um, also now in the middle of raising a late stage vehicle. So the idea is we have a complete ecosystem for technology companies. We invest in consumer services, I call it hard tech, um, things like you do here at the PME. And uh, anything else we kind of find interesting that come our way. So it's, it's really exciting. I, I get to work on a, a variety of different ideas with really smart, wonderful people. And everything we do, we really want to make an impact and a positive impact on the world. So we wouldn't call ourselves, we haven't branded ourselves ESG or sustainability. But we've been doing, I call it, impact investing since almost the very beginning when we were the first institutional investors in Tesla Motors, as an example. So it, it's mattered to us that we spend our life's energy, our, our, our people's time and our capital on investing in things and helping things scale that we believe are going to make a positive difference. Thank you. Well, just picking up on that, um, in PME's aim is to translate science into technology and to bring things into the world of commercial uh, activity. Uh, you mentioned Evozign. There's probably at least uh, 10 other companies at various stages, either of conception or realization, that are making their way forward out of PME. But Chicago isn't a premier venture investment community, so what, what are some of the steps we ought to take to uh, accelerate what we're doing into commercial uh, practice? It's an interesting question, one we've been talking a lot about, right? Yeah. Um, so I, if you'd asked me this question five years ago, I would have said, we really got to get better at getting more capital formed here, getting more funds here, getting more people here, because the world was very parochial in that if you, were, if you wanted to start a company, you kind of either had to, you had to move it to one of the coasts, move it to Silicon Valley, 
moved to Boston, which people have done, right? Jeff, you had to do that, I think, right? Um, in the, the world has changed a lot. And I think this is very important to recognize, that the world has changed a lot fundamentally, and I don't think it's going back. The funding markets, that, I call it the oligopoly funding markets that, were, that existed in places like um, Silicon Valley and Boston for, for biomedical, I think have broken. Um, I think there's a, there's a disruptive moment here. I think about things in terms of disruptive innovation, and I think this market is now sufficiently changing that there's a moment of disruption that's occurring where we can um, bring funding here using virtual tools. You know, I, I, in the early stage venture business, uh, we, have, we have written checks, small checks, without meeting teams. And I have lots of friends in the venture business that are actually doing this, that are, are allocating capital to companies that actually mean the teams using Zoom for meetings. And certainly, I think, even in a world where we're not worried about COVID, back to traveling, people, people prefer to travel less, not more. And time is the most valuable thing that we all have. I think that uh, the, the idea of vir the virtual introduction is going to be very real. So I think getting people that are maybe sitting on the coast, or frankly, some of these guys are often on the coast and now they're living in Europe or Hawaii or whatever, um, getting them to think about the ideas and the, and the companies being gestated here in Chicago uh, in a more national way, so bringing more capital here, uh, using virtual tools is, is a, a very real opportunity for us and something we should think about doing very well because it, it is changing the oligopoly. That's kind of point one. Point two, I think on the human capital side, you know, it is people are working, companies are being managed fully distributed. Certainly if you're in a lab, you can't do that. But if it's anything that relates to software, almost anything else, you know, we have, we have, uh, we invest in a company recently called Eight Sleep. It's uh, a, called a health and wellness sleep technology company. Fully distributed. Fully, you know, data scientists, you know, all over the world and fully distributed. We had lunch with a young man, Sam, who uh, came out of the PhD program here, who works in Malibu at uh, HRL. And, you know, we're sort of chatting about recruiting and how COVID has changed his, his, their, their, their situation. And I asked them permission to say this, but I, I can safely say that they are fi having trouble moving people to Malibu. I mean, who doesn't want to live in Malibu, right? This is like a, a shocking, mind-numbing, mind-bending thing to do. I'd like to go move, live in Malibu, um, minus the taxes and California politics. But the, the, the reality is that that tells you something. Um, and I, I, I think it's important for us here at PMA and the university to go to first principles, right? You've got a lot of physicists here. Go to first principles and think again about what it means to be world-class in producing technology that's commercializable and world-class in making sure we have the right investors globally, not just nationally or locally, looking at this because we are a great global university. And PME is a great global uh, institute. And I think it should, it deserves, we deserve the ability to have the best investors in the world look at our technology. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying uh, in, in part is that the, the venture investment world has changed like the entire world of work. Correct. Uh, I was talking earlier today with Jim Malakowski who's talking about, you know, people just aren't going to go back to work nine to five either. It's a little different question um, than building a company. I mean, a, a thing that concerns me a little bit is, okay, I think I, I get the picture, although I'd like to pursue it a little bit more about how you can attract an investment from afar. But there's also the question of building a company. And a lot of the companies we'd like to build do, in fact, have laboratories. Mm -hmm. They're not um, uh, alt software or, or things like that. Um, I think um, that's a little trickier proposition. Um, you know, one thing that I, I told you about is my experience in the first decade of this century in Santa Barbara. We produced a lot of technology, but the companies got moved out of town because the investors wanted them to be close. I, I think you're, you're not saying that because of the investors, but there's still the richer employment pool in that area, of, in that field of technology in some parts of the country relative to others. So. Uh, I can accept your argument that you can attract the uh, investment uh, from anywhere, uh, but the, it leaves open the question of building companies mm -hmm. anywhere, I, I think. And, um, you know, so I, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more after the, after the investment is made, what happens then? I mean, and, and you've, um, your, your company looks at the companies you invest in and helps them grow. So 
What, what's happening on that front? Yeah, we have, we have um, I'd say, a distribution of companies. And some of them have labs, some of them have factories, some of them have just software, right? And so we're seeing a whole uh, selection of these things. And I, I think that um, the idea that you would move to Santa Barbara to, like, the valley today, I'm not sure someone would do that. My guess is they might move you from Santa Barbara to Austin. Um, <laughs> Because yeah. of the environment, yeah, yeah. and or to Miami or to some other place, or maybe even to Chicago. Frankly, um, what's, when I say these oligopolies are broken, I mean that it's no longer the case that you have you want to be able to sort of walk to your company or drive to your company. For sure, when you're dealing with really hard technology, you need people sitting in labs and in factories building this stuff. Where those factories go and how they interact with the investment community, I think has changed a lot because of the tools we have available. So t today. You know, you guys could tell me, but I don't know if the things that are being funded today out of Chicago are, are, the, are, the, are the investors requiring them to move. I know as Evozon is an example, um, that's not the case. You know, the, the Evozon labs are being built on, like, near Ruby Field, right, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool, right? Like, Ruby Field's on the street, we're building this world change technology up the street. So I, I have not, I, I've seen this change at some level. I think, I think a company like Evozon may have had to move five years ago and it doesn't today. When you get out of the hard tech, out of the labs, I think that's a different matter because you're competing for talent. You want the best talent in the world. So whether, you're, whether it's your data science, people doing data science, artificial intelligence, programming, whatever it is, um, you want the best people in the world. And some of these people are so good, they won't move. And they'll just, you know, they'll say, look, I can, I can work remotely. And, and we are finding that they can be very productive. Um, it, is, it isn't that people are less productive coming in the office, particularly in, the, in these disciplines. Some of them actually are more productive because they're not being interrupted all the time. You know, it's, if you're a programmer, the worst thing possible, you're shaking your head, right? It's like some guy walks up to your desk and asks a question every 15 minutes. It's like you try to get into it. You'd rather have it all bucketed into the Zoom meeting at the beginning of the day, running your team, and at the end of the day, have another call. And we, we build some of these systems. It's going to require people to think differently about how they work and think differently about how they are, how they are managed. But, but what, I, what I think is going to happen ultimately is um, a disruption in the talent markets in the U.S., much like happened in manufacturing, might happen to the knowledge workers in the U.S. that are doing uh, computer science and data science because this is going to become a global talent pool. And the, the large technical companies today that are managing distributed teams, so all the, everyone who's like not in the office today manages distributed teams, they're building all these great tools to manage distributed teams. And those teams are now living in other parts of the country. So. I, you know, I might get the names wrong, but say tech company A, you're now living in, in Salt Lake City, Utah. They've decided to reduce your wage base to Salt Lake City, Utah, if you want to stay there. Tech company B has not. Ultimately, the system's being tested, and someone will wake up in a few years and say, wait a minute, we can run this, this team's distributed in the U.S., Salt Lake, Austin, Malibu, whatever. Why can't we run the same team distributed into Eastern Europe and India, where they have lots of engineers and great talent, just like what happened in manufacturing? And I think that's going to happen. I think, I think the tools that we are testing today and the management systems we're testing today will scale globally. And we will come back here, we'll be sitting here maybe in five years, and we'll be thinking about developers as a global talent pool the same way you think about manufacturing. So, so let's go back to the, uh, the initial investment part. Um, I mean, what, what kinds of things might we do to better engage with the investors in the technologies that we're producing? You know, do we, you know, it's, uh, making a pitch over, over Zoom is different from making a pitch in person. And yeah. I think what you're saying is there's going to be a lot more of the, the remote pitching. And, you know, you don't make quite the same connection uh, with people uh, over Zoom, but uh, maybe there are some advantageous things about it. What do you, what do you think about that and, uh, you know, how we could train people to really communicate their ideas more effectively to investors? I think this is a reality. We have to do it. We have to figure it out. And we're thinking about it for our own firm. I think you know, one of the, um, the interesting things about this for me is I've turned 50 this year. And the idea of building a relationship with someone using like a video chat and text is foreign to me. It really is foreign to me. It isn't foreign to my 18-year-old son. It's very normal. Like very, very normal. He has friends that, you know, he plays video games. He has friends that live in other parts of the world. And I see people shaking their heads like, this is real. And uh, those of us, like me, who think about it as I have to sit across from you and have dinner with you and really spend time with you to get to know you, um, we may be dinosaurs 
in 10 years. We just, we may not, we may just, we may, we're getting disrupted right now. Um, and that's the reality of it. And so I, I think it's, we need to lean into the reality of what we live in today. We just accept it for what it is, which is relationships are being built um, over, these, over these virtual tools. The pitch, it's the relationship itself that's being built over the virtual tools. I think it starts, as we were talking about yesterday, I think it's probably a bigger uh, ecosystem design than just like the pitch. It's educating, it's building relationships, it's becoming a, part of, a valuable part of the information sharing between the university and some of these venture capitalists around the world or even in the U.S. Um, but I think it needs, be, it needs to be broadly conceived from first principles again. We should think about it carefully. We are thinking about it at our firm because the, peop the folks that are like you know, in their 20s and 30s, they just see the world differently than, than I do. But the reality is they are the future. I am, you know, I'm the present, they are the future. And we need to design our systems for the future not for what happened yesterday, but what will come five years from now. And so I, I, I think this is just, we better get used to it, because it's, it's, it's reality. Well, well, I think it's quite possible that there's ways to do better remotely than in person, too. I, yeah. uh, you know, the whole experience is different, let, let's say. And, uh, you know, what um, we also talked about yesterday is the, the establishment of trust, and how do you do that if you like never met the person right and, and you know maybe you said this I've, I, uh, but you you've made a, a lot of investments in the last year and a half where you haven't met the people right I mean, yeah, we, we, we've, we've made I'd say small investments so we we still if we write a big check I I still feel that I, I need I want to meet the people yeah. and um, but I do know I have friends and I'm gonna remain nameless who are writing reasonable size venture checks without meeting the people and who think it's actually better because they're the, it removes some of the um, the salesmanship and some of the like the the charisma effect of writing a bad you know writing a bad check over someone just really great at telling the story versus is the is the data good are the numbers right does it make sense to you and the and there it also it's interesting because it it the velocity of funding has gone up a lot because of these tools but I don't know that the amount of time that someone's thinking about it has gone down in other words uh, because you're not traveling around you're you're able to do more. But I, I don't think that's actually changed the amount of time people are thinking about the investment. It, it actually may have gone up in terms of the data and the analysis and what's really happening. The people in early stage investments are always very, very important. So you have to figure out a way to qualify them and, and, and make sure that they're like talented, good people and they're going to do the right thing. That's, that's because they never finish where they start. I mean, even in hard tech, they never really finish where they start. Um, but this is a question that's open. I don't have a great answer to it. I think we should think about it. We have lots of smart people in Chicago. I think someone could figure it out. Do, do you think? PME um, faculty ought to take some steps to either have a presence elsewhere in the United States or, or, or visit or, you know, make ourselves known. I, I, I mean, I, I've found that it's pretty easy to go to a company or, or a firm and uh, get a pleasant reception and have people listen to you. But I, you know, we want to not just uh, spend our time on anything. We'd like to you know, accomplish something. What what kinds of things might we do by getting out of Chicago and uh, projecting our activities around the country or the world, for that matter? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't know that I would. I think about sort of capital allocation of capital and time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I would suggest that we allocate capital to building physical locations anymore. I, mean, I, I don't. You know, I think you're probably better off building a density of capital in one location and having all your people come in and have people come here. And in terms of getting out and traveling, probably a good idea. But I would again refer you to like maybe the, the precursor to that is we use the virtual tools to make sure that that trip is very, very useful and that the return on that trip on our time is very useful. And I think it's a combination of these things. You know, it's sort of thinking again about like, okay, how do we how do we get to the right people? How do we make sure we're relevant? We have relevant information they want to share, they want from us. So there's you know there's information sharing the relationship, and then we're going to that meeting for a reason. We're actually going to talk about you know a particular part, a particular technology or something we're going to do and accomplish something. I think I think that is probably the way to do it. That's how we are thinking about our businesses. The first set, many of the first meetings are happening um, virtually. We're getting information, we're analyzing it, and then you know there might be another virtual meeting. And then if, before we do something, we're going to go see the person, or they're going to come see us. We're going to, we're going to have an in-person meeting. I think that's the way the world's going generally, and I think we should adapt to that here. Does the current environment change the threshold for what you'll look at? I mean, you, you know, there's always the question of getting somebody to actually look at your business plan or look at the, some 
plan. And what you just said leads me to think the answer to this is no, because you put about the same amount of time in analysis regardless. But I'm curious whether the remote environment enables you to kind of get in the virtual door a little easier in some ways. I, I definitely think the barrier to a meeting has gone down. Yeah, it's definitely gone down mm -hmm. because um, it's just easier to do, you know. And I, I, I think that uh, in particular, depends on who you're meeting with, right? Some like my schedule is super packed, so getting on it is, is is getting something on it is is tough. But for our our VPs who are doing something for a screening of of, of these deals, um, you know, they're seeing more stuff. I mean, our backlog's gotten bigger, not smaller, and the triage of that backlog is, I think. Um, probably a little less rigorous in the first couple of stages because we're not having to go somewhere to do something, right? We can spend more time thinking about it before you go do something and we can qualify a little more if we go do something. But we're thinking about our business process. I mean, I think that a lot of this is happening kind of anecdotally in the world. We're, we're like, you know, lean manufacturing guys from the, from the 90s. So we're thinking about our business process and how to really do this. But for sure, um, our backlog is as big as it's ever been and it's um, getting bigger, not smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there, are there places that, uh, I mean, universities, let's say, or, um, and I, I guess I'm not talking about the big ones. I mean, let's leave Stanford and MIT off the table, but uh, academic institutions that you've seen that have good practices, that get good exposure for what they're doing, uh, that, that you know of? Or, I mean, what I'm really thinking about is what, what's our competition to break in from a place that isn't that prominent just yet. Um, but I don't have an answer to that question, but I'd like to answer a different question, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Answer any question you like. <laughs> so, so the question I'd like to answer is, has the change in the environment made the, and I think of it almost like an oligopoly, in funding and company creation that Stanford, MIT, and a few other universities have, has it made this oligopoly assailable? Right? That's a key question here for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, is it worth doing? If, you, if, you're, if you're, you're, you're assaulting an oligopoly, which I've done a couple times in my career, um, an entrenched oligopoly, and you're asking yourself the question, of like, can we do it? Right? We're going to like storm the Citadel. Can we do it? I think it's more probable now that it can be done than ever. And I think it can be done. I think we can use these tools and the change in the markets to go get their money. Why not? Yeah. Why shouldn't we? Why, why not? Why wouldn't we? Why, why wouldn't we want to try and do that? Um, as yeah. opposed to asking ourselves, like, hey, let's go figure out how to kind of eat at the fields around the citadel. Why don't we just go attack the citadel? Because it's it's vulnerable, <laughs> and um, I think it's more vulnerable now than it's ever been. And I think that's a, for me anyway. That's a much more exciting question. To try to figure out and, and help with, then um, you know we're going to probably be number eight or nine or ten. I think we should try to be number one. We might fail. We might be number four, but so what? At least we tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I'm I'm very uh, you know um, building PME has been a startup in an academic yeah. sense, and you know I never hesitated to ask somebody if they'd like to join us because they were already at a good place. In fact, that was more or less my bar. I wanted right. people to, you know, I wanted to have to persuade people to come. And yeah. That sort of thing. So How did it work out? Yeah. Pretty well so okay. far. Yeah. So. It's possible. As long as the, and you are, there's a lot of physics, as long as like the basic physics work and like we, we don't think it's going to actually, like we're going to die trying, let's try. Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask you about your own firm, just because I'm, I'd, li I'd like to get a little more feel for how judgments are made in a firm like yours. What kind of people do you hire? This is a great question, and lots of investors are asking this question. You know, we have a very diverse uh, workforce, mostly because, I mean, I come from a diverse background, a couple of my partners from a diverse background, and we started that way. And so we've been hiring um, people that look very different from each other. The firms like ours often have a tendency to sort of hire people that have the same kind of background and go to look all the same, right? Um, Ours is not. Uh, we are looking for very smart people with, uh, with differences in backgrounds. Over the years, we sort of wax and wane between do we hire from just fancy universities or, or like, you know, let's say kids who are scrappier who went to maybe like different universities. And we try to create a mix of this, actually. We try to create a mix of people that, that have uh, 
you know, I'd say very strong academic backgrounds, others that come from more, I call it, you know, different schools that may not be as high ranked, but worked very hard and did very well. Um, and then we hire from different kinds of firms. And we do this on purpose because I, I've always believed that a diversity of views leads to a better outcome if we can manage that diversity well, right? So we have to manage the process well. And we have a whole investment process that does that. And we, we actually do it um, in sort of using the scientific method. We actually have, it's hypothesis testing. Right, so someone creates a positive hypothesis about a, a company they want to invest in, and then the entire diligence process is about testing that hypothesis. And by the time you get to an investment committee, the decision's already been made because you've already tested along the way, and people are learning through that testing process. So it allows us to hire people that I think have very different um, uh, views of the world, and then coordinate it through that process. So, I mean, on another people-related question, you, you know, uh, we talk about how can you make good presentations over Zoom? And you know, I don't, I, I don't know. You, you could comment on this too. How important the presentation is compared to how uh, impressive the content of the presentation is, like the people and, and that sort of thing. I mean, how do you, how do you really judge people? Let's say. I mean, I, 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 I believe that the people are probably the most important ingredient. Um, experience, background, or, or is it more on their demeanor in the interaction that you have with them through whatever medium you're having it? I mean, it's interesting, you know, I think that um, the world has changed here. So we would have said before, we'd go to a meeting, the first meeting would be important, we get them the people and think about the, think about the technology or the business plan or whatever. It's almost not reversed, where we're thinking about the, you know, the, the information and the, the research around the technology we're investing in, and then we go meet the people to make sure it makes sense to us. So it, I, I think it has, has, it has changed. Um, I think people are always the most important thing, ultimately, right? But what, what the world has done is it, it has sort of shifted the way we, we think about it and when we made that decision, and also changed um, the way we do it. So we, you know, we, we, for us, Nirvana is like, we write a small check, you know, one to five billion, we get to know a company, and then we write a twenty-five or thirty million dollar check, and then we write a hundred million dollar check. And so, you know, our largest investment is SpaceX, and we've been investing it since two thousand five, and continuing. And we, we're about to put more capital to it. We just raised a new vehicle to put more money in. So, you know, that is what we want to do. The way we get to know people over time um, hasn't changed. That it hasn't changed in the sense that, like, I would not be, be comfortable unless we knew the sector really, really well. And we knew this was the right company. We already knew the people basically because we were in the sector. I would not be comfortable writing a, a large check you know, a company that we just met. Zoom, no Zoom, COVID, no COVID. We just, we never did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm just gonna bring up one more question, but I bet there's a lot more questions in this room. So think about jumping into this, uh, to this conversation sometime soon. But you know, we're, some of our discussion on this topic centered around we, we would like to make a contribution not only to the world by inventing new technologies that society needs and indicates that they need them by the willingness to pay for them. We would like to help Chicago with what we're doing. And to some extent, the whole tenor of our last half hour has been location isn't that important anymore. But let's say we took it as a basic premise that we wanted our work here to also help Chicago. Do you have any thoughts about acts that we could do that would meet that objective? And I, I, we've gone beyond what Antonio and I talked about beforehand, so yeah. I'm, I'm catching him a little off guard with this last question. So, I mean, look, I'm, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, and I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And um, Chicago, and I've, you know, I ended up living in, in New York, London, Tokyo, et cetera, before I came back here. And I settled here to raise my family. Um, three kids, two of which went to the lab school here on, on the university campus. And Chicago is a great city. It's a great American city. It really is. And it, it has its struggles, as you know. And in the last couple of years, it's had a lot of struggles. It is worth actually finding a way to help Chicago and investing in Chicago. The question I would ask, um, us here is, should it be a primary objective or a consequence of what we do? And I think that New York Chicago is, it's the New York Chicago. It's always going to be here. It anchors the south side of Chicago. 
which as we all know is a challenged area of Chicago, right? And the more successful this university is, the better Chicago will be, right? I think you know, the, the old saying, uh, the, business of, the business of General Motors is America, the business of America is General Motors. The reality is the business theory of Chicago is Chicago. Um, so I would think about this as, let's just really be successful. Let's build great technology here. Let's really make this a hub, like, you know, the quantum exchange is an example of this, right? We are the best in the world at quantum. That's awesome. It's amazing for Chicago. Amazing for Chicago. It will bring lots of talented people here. It will, it will give us global notoriety as a city. It will even, you know, the, the knock-on effects of that are hard to like, measure, but they are real. That's how we think about this. We should, we should think about it as, let's, just, let's really make sure we're successful, and the more successful this university is, the better the city's gonna be. And the better the south side will be, even more important just the city, the better the south side will be. And that matters a lot. Yeah, I really like that answer because that's what we know how to do, try to drive our own mission as successfully and powerfully and as fast as we can, so. Yeah, it, it is very hard to have, you know, I think about any, any company or university, whatever it is, any, any organization, as a sum total of the vectors of activity of the people in it. And the more like we off-target vectors, the harder it is to create for them and to be successful. I think we should be full on target, making this university great, making PME great, and that will then spill out into making the city great. Thank you, Antonio. Um, Thank you, man. I'd like to open up the floor for uh, questions from the floor, if uh, we could. We have one from Professor De Pablo right up front here. Um, this is going to be a tough one, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Antonio, you mentioned several times that Chicago is a great global university. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, about what you think as a, of, uh, of a global university? What are the key attributes of a global university? Because that means different things to different people in the audience, I am sure. So from your perspective, what, what is it? So I. Th it's a very interesting question, actually. Let me think about it for a second. A university is really, a, it's not about the bricks and mortar and, and the buildings, it's about the people, right? And my experience with this university is it's a great, great global aggregator of people. And of us, people who come here, I think are very academically minded and free thinkers, right? This is a, a you know, I, I, I was, I don't think I've ever been more proud of being a graduate of this university than I was when I read uh, Bob Zimmer's op-ed, I think it was in the, Wall Street, in, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal, about academic freedom and freedom of speech on campus. That was an extraordinary moment of courage by Bob and the university in making a statement about who we are in a world that is, in many ways, judging that stance negatively. I think it's very important that we maintain that we are a beacon of light, of freedom, of academic freedom in this world, and that we build programs. The programs are great. They are, I think, secondary to the mission of being a, a beacon of academic freedom and a freedom of thought. And everything else we build around that, I think, should stay in keeping with this mission. And we will attract the best people in the world who believe in this. And the people who don't believe in that, who are really smart, we probably don't want to attract. That, that's what it means to me. And that's what I think, I think we should protect um, as we go forward in time. I hope 100 years from now, when we're all gone and forgotten, the University of Chicago is still known as a bastion of academic freedom and of, of freedom of thought. Is there a question over there? I, Maria, is there somebody with the microphone over there? No, oh, okay. Jeff. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the, you know, some of your comments on distributed workforce versus a localized business. And ask about uh, leadership versus at the bench. I'm speaking of laboratory-based companies. Um, you know, so Chicago has a great supply of people who can be very effective at the bench. Maybe, at least in the biotech sector, where we lack a little bit is those who would be in the C-suite leading the company. Uh, so I'm thinking about a company that I started this in, in Boston, but where the, the C-suite hasn't been in the office for a year and a half. The, the guys in the lab, the people in the lab, they've been there every day, and it's worked out perfectly fine. Would you invest in a Chicago-based company where the, the, the people in the lab were there physically and where the leadership was all over the United States or all over the world? Do you, in other words, do you think that this, this C-suite needs to be co-localized with the people at the bench at, in the beginning of a company? I don't. I have invested in companies um, 
nothing truly hard tech like you're talking about, right? But like, I mean, eight sleeps good example of this. They're making a product. They have, do have some technology. They're, you know, they're applying sensors to sleep basically on top of a pad or a mattress to get like really good health data from you. So it's not the kind of stuff you're talking about, but it's a few layers back in terms of difficulty. Supply chain over the world, c suite over the world. I mean, it, it works. It has to, we have to be comfortable that the management, that the executives can manage this way. And they will come when they need to, right? So um, I, I do think it, this requires some thought about what the cadence of, of being in person is, who's in person when, how they come. And I just want to talk about that. I want to understand that from whomever was running this company. But I don't think it's necessary, no. Thank you. Yeah. Way in the back. Back where you were, Fabian, I guess. Yep. Yeah, just one more thought, and just, I don't think it's necessary. I, I, still, am, I still have this bias where I think it would be better, but I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Unji, just to give a little background, and um, I was a postdoc with Matt, um, and I'm an assistant professor at USC in LA. Um, I think this is a little bit more specific to the more earlier um, investigator. I'm five years in, and I do come across conversations and a lot of emails come forth regarding um, being interested in my technology and having these conversations from different types of um, companies that might want to create companies, um, new startups, or more traditional VC types. But at the end, even regardless of like an NDA, I was just kind of wondering from your perspective, you, they can't really unsee kind of what you show. And you're kind of in that zone where you're trying to be protective of your stuff, um, but you're also trying to pitch. And so from your perspective, I was just kind of curious about the, the advice that you could give. So your question is like, how worried are you about IP relative to um, like people stealing it basically? Yeah. Yeah. And this IP is protected or not protected? It's like a trade uh, secret or like a real IP? Uh, patent pending. Okay. I mean, look, I have a very non-traditional view of these things. Um, I think it's very hard to protect IP over any period of time. And particularly if, I don't, what, what kind of technology are you working on? What is it? Nanomedicine. Yeah, I mean, this is like a global market. And if it's really valuable, uh, if an American doesn't steal it, someone outside the US will. So just, you know, it, it, they're already in your lab and your systems. There's probably somebody already running around that's going to do that. So like, I, I would just, I would worry more about, I'd, this is the truth of it, right? You just accept the fact that industrial espionage is real globally. And if you have a, a great piece of IP that's going to like change the world in nanomedicine, um, man, if you don't commercialize it fast in the US and it's commercializable, uh, it's going to get stolen somewhere else anyway, and you're going to lose it to someone who won't give you anything with it, uh, won't pay you at all. They'll get, you get no economic benefit. So I would think less about how do I maximize economic benefit, more about how do I get out in the world fast enough that no one can catch me. And speed is your best uh, protection against IP theft. Because the faster you're innovating, the faster they, you know, they can't steal it all. They, they can't steal what's in your head, right? No one can take that. And how fast you drive the innovation and change and how fast you get to market and commercialize, that is the key. Because then what really will protect you is your market share. Thank you. Hello, Antonio. Um, so a number of clean tech technologies take they could take decades, for example. So is the VC model actually the best model to bring those things to market? Or do we need to lean on governments to help that may have longer time frames in mind uh, than, than a typical VC would be? Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a role. I, there's definitely a role. Let me rephrase your question. Is there a role for government in funding early stage technology, right? That's the question. Or the antithesis is the VC the better approach? Because a number of yeah. It's 08, uh, lots of, um, maybe a decade before, a number of battery startups came up and died because the VCs had maybe a shorter, or the, the stereotype is that they had a shorter time frame in mind for when these products would come to market. So now again, the VCs are back into the, uh, into the discussion. Is that the best model uh, for these hard tech uh, technologies? I, I think it's a combination of both. I, mean, I think the reality is that the, this is a, a, a bigger question about US industrial policy. I mean, I do believe in the U.S. needs a real industrial policy, which we kind of don't have. It sort of comes at times out of the DOE or out of the, out of the Department of Defense in pieces, bits and pieces. But we don't think of, we're not thinking about it kind of um, in, in, a, in, a, in a holistic global manner. But to the extent that you can get 
uh, government funding to build early stage technology, I think this is a great thing to do. You should do it. It's very important. And you should also think about how to get private funding. These are not mutually exclusive. Right? If you're, you have a company and you have a government grant, and you, that's going to help you get venture money. Right? And so there, it, there's a flywheel there that's very important to think about. Um, and often, you know, government dollars are first dollars in to work on really hard stuff. And I think that's important. The government should do more of this. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, so I'm wondering, you mentioned when you were in law school, you had an idea to start your business starting to invest in small industrial companies. What was that like beginning that for the first time? And also, just what was it like um, going into that business? How did you come to sort of starting that from being in law school? And what was it like in the early days? So what school are you in the PME? Or where, where? I am in the PME. Yeah. yeah. Man, if I answer this question, I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> can, I get myself in, can I get myself in trouble? Is it okay, man? Can I get myself in trouble and give me a bad bet? You can't bet? get yourself in trouble. Okay. Don't worry about it. So, I mean, when I said I was the world's worst law student, it, it, I meant this um, because I just stopped one class. Um, and, you know, took the exams and uh, they may not... I, uh, it's a hack. I, if I say it out loud, they might change the rules. But in the old days, it was like you had a number, and you'd take that number to your like your exam, and you sign a CD chart, right? When you came in, but if you never signed the scene chart, the press didn't know you weren't there. So I figured that out the first quarter. If I just stopped signing in, no one knew I wasn't there, and I just uh, my friend David Sachs, the guys gave me their notes, and I like read the book, and I took the exams, and I did graduate, I did pass the bar, so it worked, and then I, I worked full time. Um, that's how I did it. It was, I, you know, in fairness, the University of Chicago experience for me was extraordinary because I did go to the writing lab, which is great, and I did actually meet some wonderful people, and I did learn a lot by studying this material, right? I learned, like, the thought process was very important. But I got to tell you, I didn't go to class very much. So um, I'm not telling you to do that <laughs> at all. And I, I didn't tell my own son to do this, but I'm just answering your question honestly. And if there are some people who are kind of born entrepreneurs and just want to do this kind of thing. And in those days, dropping out of school, I went to law school because my parents are immigrants. And my mother died when I was in high school. And my father had really convinced himself and me that their mission in life was to have all of their children have doctoral degrees. So brothers are doctors, a dentist, and he really wanted me to be a lawyer. J.D. counts, by the way, from his mind. And um, I mean, I count anyone else's mind, but it counts in his mind. And I wanted to do this for him and for my family, and so I did it. But I wasn't committed to being a lawyer, so I didn't, I didn't take it seriously in that way. But it, listen, it was definitely for my life, because I you know, met, some, met a guy like David Sachs, and it made me go maybe a little more right than I would have always gone. I was already thinking about technology, but it really made me lean hard. Yeah. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Hey, Paul, how are you? <laughs> it's coming. So I wanted to ask you about how has the venture community changed uh, in, uh, from when you started, right? So I'll, I'll pick an example, I'll pick energy. So 2005, there were a lot of energy investments, tech investments that failed mm -hmm. in that time frame. And in part, it was because duration of the funds were too short for energy uh, capital investment, I think so. And the amount of money needed to mature hard tech you know, it took a lot more. And a lot of the venture funds just didn't have too, too short dur duration or not enough size of the fund. Yeah. Um, what else has happened I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the evolution of the, the kind of the venture community, you know, besides that sort of, you know, change? Yeah. So look, I tell people we made money in clean tech because we're not clean tech investors. Um, I, I think we'd, 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 you just put a very positive spin on the failure. And I appreciate the positive, thank you. Um, but let me give you a, a slightly different interpretation of how this failure occurred. So what, what Paul's talking about is there were a number of venture funds raised like in the mid-2000s, um, you know, and a number of venture funds that pivoted hard into clean tech, like Kleiner Perkins is an example of this. And virtually all of these investments, almost all of them, were like zeros. The one that wasn't a zero was Tesla Motors. 
And so why do we invest in Tesla Motors and not something like Fisker or other stuff that's kind of that illustrates your question? Um, because we weren't actually being forced to invest in anything. And we found a piece of technology that was amazing in the battery pack, the software, and the motor, that gestalt. And so, it, by the way, Elon was running this company at the time, right? It was, it was, um, it was someone else. And we met J.B. Straubel, who was the founder of this company. It was great. Um, and, and, and then, you know, Elon was the chairman. We had a lot of respect for him from our, our uh, PayPal investments. So we made an investment in this company because they basically lined up for us. And we believed in the idea that we had to come off the carbon supply chain. That was our overall thesis. Um, we'd invest in some natural gas assets as a, bridge, as a bridge fuel as well in the same fund. So in the same fund you find Tesla Motors, you find some natural gas assets that are a bridge fuel to full electric because our overall thesis is coming off the carbon supply chain. That worked. And a few other things we did worked. If we had been, if we'd raised a $500 million dollar fund to invest just in clean tech, we would have failed. I mean, we wouldn't have failed because we had one or two big winners and it would have been a bunch of zeros. I think this is the problem. Um, when you have very, very heavily verticalized uh, in investment, it can work great or it can not work well because you're, you're competing for capital with ideas that may not work. And so what we, when we look at the world, one of the reasons I like running a multi-strategy growth fund now is it allows us to look across the technology platforms and, the, and different kinds of investors are making and they compete with capital one against the other. So we end up only titrating to the very best stuff. And because we have an operating group that, that does scale, we can typically get into these investments uh, because people want what we have, which is like the, the nuts and bolts of building a business, right? Um, there's a real lesson in this for where we are today because verticalized venture strategies are like really popular. And I think artificial intelligence is another place you're going to see the same kind of landscape. I mean, you know, um, there's a lot of money being raised in qu quantum computing. I mean, I won't name the company, but Matt knows. Uh, you know, PME helped me do diligence on a company that I think might have raised, I don't know, if it's not a billion, several hundred million dollars in quantum computing, and it's a zero. Literally a zero. Um, I'm sure you know the company I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a zero. And there's so much money available now, it's not going to be as visible. Like you won't, you know, Kleiner Perkins almost went down over this, right? They, they blew up an entire fund over clean tech. So it won't look um, the same because there's so much money in the world that's going to get hidden a little bit more at the edges. But it's going to happen. It's happening again right now. There's a massive bubble going on in some of these technology platforms. And lots of capital flowing for stuff that like when I talk to um, to the folks at PME who will be diligent says, you know, they're kind of like, mm, don't think so. And I was like, oh yeah, don't think so. But if you're not a technologist and you're some venture guy who thinks he's a technologist, like I know I'm not a technologist, I'm very in touch with that. Uh, I've got to find someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, you know, if you went to business school and you studied artificial intelligence and chips for like three years you, and you think you're an expert, you're not. You're just not. And it's going to happen again. Please. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question kind of for both of you. Um, I think like your vision on building a virtual working environment really makes me to reflect on the virtual education for this past year, that there are many like um, challenges we face, but like we are going back in person. However, when we reflect on it, we've put a lot of cap capital, human capital and even money, to build a whole new infrastructure for teaching these lessons online and like making these resources available accessible through like the global like across the globe. Do you think like after this year of pandemic we should retain some of this infrastructure so that we don't waste away this money? And how do you think that is um, that is to be carried out? I have a little difficulty with the mask, so I'm not sure I caught the entire... Maybe take the mask off, repeat the question. We didn't quite yeah, understand maybe, the answer. Just give me a brief version. I, I think I caught what you were saying, but thanks. Oh, um, I was just um, asking a question about, so after the t we built so much um, teaching resources, like a, a re infrastructure for teaching online, we yeah. invested a lot of capital and human resources into um, how to teach online. Do you think any of these things could be retained after the pandemic and become something that is related to your vision on the virtual working environment? Well, you, you know, there there's been companies, of course, based on that kind of thing for a while. And in, in some sense, the, 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 the starter of this was uh, MIT's open courseware uh, I, I don't know if you're asking me about a business uh, aspect of this or just whether it's, you know, a good idea and uh, something a university should be doing. I, I don't 
I'll defer anything to anybody else about whether it's a good business to get into. But I actually like what MIT has done in, in open courseware, and I think it's an example that other universities should follow. I, I don't feel that the things that we talk about in our classrooms are really proprietary. Uh, I mean, first of all, they represent our best thinking when we're talking about the subject at the time. But, you know, when I teach a course a second time, I rethink it entirely from the beginning. So the, that kind of thing is not a static product that we put out there. So anything that we put out in open courseware would be last year's product, and I'd be thinking about next year's. So I think it's something that universities should be doing. The, the companies like um, Coursera and uh, what is it, edX, uh, mm -hmm. at, um, and, and um, uh, other, others, I, I don't know. I think they, they have an interesting product and, and make things accessible to people that uh, wouldn't be otherwise. I don't really know much about their business uh, success. Thank you. You know, I might add one thing. Are you a student here? Are you a student? Or a, yes, I'm a yeah. graduate student, um, yeah. so I was TAU for some courses. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I might add, I think Matt's totally right, but as a consumer of education, I might add, I might add one thought, which is, you know, there is a view that universities are at some level worried about all this IP going online virtual because anyone can see it, like this open course idea, right? Like, why do I care about MIT degree or Harvard degree or Chicago degree if I can get it online, right, for $1.95 in, in internet charges? Um, the reason, if and it is important, you being a student here, that I think my education was great and I would do it again and I encourage my children to go to university is that what matters about the education here at UC, in hearing Matt teach a class matters a lot, but you can do that online. It actually, it's the people at this table with you. That's what matters. And so I, I think that it's the, the class itself is great, but the context of the university setting with the people you're interacting with and the ideas you're sharing and how that's growing and how you're changing and how it, your mind and the way you think changes by interacting with the people. And then the, the, the interaction with the professor offline when you go to office hours and you talk and the, this is what matters, I think, in university setting. So I agree with Matt. I think this is like, we should put all the learning in the world online, it's better for the world. But that, that actually means, I think, that the value of being here will be even higher because it's going to attract even more great people to come here. Yep, I, I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Maybe, Maria, if you could go to this fellow. And Fabian, could you come up here? Here. Maria, for this fellow in the blue shirt. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead. Just talk into the microphone, okay? No, the, the microphone's fine. You just have to talk into it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, in, the re in the recent years, I think our department has been divided into three different divisions, and actually I'm in the material science division. So, it's highly possible for me to find my job in the manufacturing industry. So, but compared to the data science or computer science data analysis, I didn't feel um, the manufacturing is still growing. So what do you think about this fact and how do you comment on it? Or do you have any suggestions to the students like me um, still trying to find the job in the manufacturing? How do you think? Well, let, let me take a step at this. Um, first of all, you know, we've, we've sort of steadily tried to resist uh, what you said is a, is a fact, that is, <laughs> that we're split into three divisions. Uh, we really are, are more integrated than that. But you, you know, you're right. There's only so much we can do with uh, you know, 30 some faculty members. So creating a, a program in manufacturing, I, I think actually could be interesting as we think in the future. I doubt that it would be manufacturing the way it might be conceived of at Purdue or something like that. But you know, the, the molecular engineering of process technology, I think that's something that, that would be within our reach to do. But we can't do everything with a small number of people. In fact, that's exactly the opposite of the model we've taken. We're trying to do 
you know, kind of three focus things very well so that in those areas at least we can compete with the very best in the world. Hello. So my question is for both of you actually. Um, and so my question is basically about the best way for a university to harness talent around the world. So the traditional approach of universities, I think, has been to get people from around the world using its brand name. And um, but a new model, a relatively new model, is like what NYU has been doing, which is opening campuses in um, in other parts of the world. Like I think they've opened one in Shanghai and Abu Dhabi. For the 21st century, which approach do you think is better um, for harnessing talent around the world? Well, uh, I'll give Antonio time to no, that's think for you. a little that, bit. That's, that's, that's above my pay grade for sure. This, but, uh, um, you know, the University of Chicago has uh, done something that uh, addresses what you're talking about, but in a different way. We have uh, campuses in Hong Kong, London, Paris, uh, Delhi. Um, I, I know there's more, but those are the ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Oh, Beijing. Um, and we don't treat them as uh, outpost campuses where we offer coursework and things like that. We um, treat them more like embassies or consulates or something like that, places where we can convene the local people in an environment that the University of Chicago, you know, uh, informs and inspires. And I think the argument against what you were saying is a little bit related to what Antonio was saying. You know, uh, we have something on this campus that is special. We can't just transform it into delivering the same kind of thing in Hong Kong. So I think, uh, you know, I, I'm not criticizing what other universities are doing, but I don't think that's the direction we're going to go in. I'm going to give the last word to Jim Malachowski. So first of all, Antonio, thank you, because you were the introduction to PME for me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> thank um, you, I have uh, really two questions that draw upon your Valor experience. The first is, given the environment that we're in, the accelerating pace of technology, and the relationship you've had with iconic CEOs such as Alan, has your view of what makes a great startup CEO changed? And then my second question is, I know Valor is very consultative with its clients across all industries. Has Matt yet tapped you to give him consulting advice on how to grow PME? Um, OK, so question number one first, right? Um, <laughs> has it changed? Uh, it has definitely evolved. So in the beginning, it's easy to find a product genius and sort of say, okay, we're going to back this product genius. And sometimes we got lucky and we saw genius when other people saw a little insanity. Um, that, that's an, that was an easier thing to do in the beginning. Today, so many different kinds of people are starting companies that we've got, we have to think about this more broadly. And particularly because not everything we do is hard tech. In the hard tech world, you're really looking for product people. I mean, the, the leader of a company, whether it's CTO or CEO, really has to be a product person. And in our, in our Nirvana world, it is the product person is the CEO because they're driving it, right? So this idea of like when to bifurcate business from product, I mean, it works, it can work, but it's, it's not like, it's not the ideal, ideal state. Um, because the tools, uh, the software tools to do uh, pretty much everything else are so easy now and so commoditized, we see lots of different kinds of people starting companies, and particularly like in the consumer space, the business service software stuff. Um, and so now we're looking for more traditional kind of leaders. Like you know, there's, I think about sort of, the, and I think about them in forms, right? There's, there, there's the product genius. Um, there's sort of the, the called the athlete coach CEO, the servant leader. These these things that like exist in business schools, they're real actually, and and we we look for those those kinds of models and we find them. Yeah. So it's, it's gotten it's gotten broader. Uh, because so, it's so much easier to start a company. And the barrier is so low, and lots of different kinds of people are doing it, for sure. Yeah. Second question about Matt. Matt has asked me lots of questions. I'm, you know, I'd, I'd leave it to him whether they're valuable answers or not um, about scale. But we have, we have been talking about a number of things. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking, to talking more about it, yeah, for sure. Um, 
before I leave this, could I, I want to answer this question about manufacturing just yeah, uh, sure. real quickly, because I think, I think manuf manufacturing is near to my heart. I started there, and there's this idea in, in America that manufacturing is shrinking. And I think in the aggregate, it probably is shrinking, but not at the very high end. So I don't know what you're working on, but the example I'll give you is like cells, right? And we know a lot about energy at University of Chicago. This is coming back to the U.S. So there, there, there's a there's an, there's a quasi industrial policy now. The Trump trade war was about bringing technologies back. I think that was not a great way to do it. But ultimately, we have to make stuff in the U.S. It's strategic to us. And material science is a very very important part of this. So I really want to encourage you. Um, my youngest son actually is thinking about studying material science because this is actually uh, going to be really important. So it may, you may look at it right now and say, well, the last ten years this didn't look so good, but. There's this thing, what is it, you want, to, you want to skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been? I think you are where the puck is going. It will actually be a time in the U.S., I hope and I believe, where there's a renaissance in very high-tech, um, hard technology manufacturing, because we have to do it. Before Tesla built its, um, our, our gigafactory in Nevada, all the cells, all the human cells, were coming from Asia. Strategically, this is kind of insane. If there's a shooting war in the Pacific, we can't run our radios. Right? In the biotech world, almost all, all, the, all the manufacturing of the actual drugs is being done in India. This is not smart for us. So at post-COVID, and as we're thinking about what the world looks like for the United States, and look, whether it's the US, Europe, China, whatever, this is all going to localized. And it will be localized into parts of the world, and there will be driving technological change using material science. So I think it's important to do. I would keep doing it. Thank you. I think we're about at the end of our time, so Great. Th thank you very much. I really appreciate Thank you, it. man. Great, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.